welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks. I'm thrilled you can join us today. We are going to be having a conversation about practical tips and candid conversations for Alzheimer's and dementia family caregivers. And boy, we all need this kind of information. But before I introduce you to our guests, I always want to give a couple of shout outs. So two things, I do a couple of support groups. One is a memory cafe that is virtual. I do that twice a month on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. And then if you happen to be in Minnesota in the Shoreview area, The last Wednesday of the month, we do a Caregiver Connect at the Shoreview Community Center, and we meet from like 10 to 1130, and we also have respite care for your loved ones. So you can just reach out to me at radio at Alzheimer Speaks. I can get you the information for that. I also want to encourage you to go to alzheimerspeaks.com, check out all of our free educational resources. I think you'll be shocked at all that's there. Please also visit our sister company, Dementia Map, which is a resource directory, has a calendar of events, a glossary of terms, some wonderful articles, and it's free to access. And then last, I want to encourage you to visit twiddles. There you will find some sensory tools that are absolutely fantastic that can cut the agitation and bring the calmness back. And uh, that works wonderful during sundowning or travel or just anytime someone's feeling a little fidgety, maybe in a new environment. They also have a product called adapt wrap And with adapt wrap Um, that is a product that is great for somebody who doesn't have uh, wonderful mobility anymore, who doesn't have a lot of flexibility, might not be able to lift their arms. Um, Everything can be put on very easily and then secured in the back. Works great for someone who disrobes as well, which sometimes can be an issue for people. So with that, let's go ahead and meet our guest today. Well, it is time to get these gals on the show. We have been talking for ages. Um, They're doing some really cool, cool stuff. Um, So I'm so excited, Sue, to have you on the show. You've been on before. And Nancy, to have you on. I'm really interested in this partnership and and what you guys are going to be bringing to the table and how you're going to be changing lives. But before we dive into all that, I'm going to have each of you introduce yourself. So, Sue, if you don't mind, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. All right. Thank you very much, Lori, and thank you for having us both today. As she said, my name is Sue Ryan, and I've been in a variety of roles of caregiving support for family and loved ones over the past 40 years, in parallel with my roles as a business professional. My early journeys as a caregiver were just brutal. I didn't know what I didn't know. There weren't lessons. There wasn't the internet. People didn't talk about it. I said I often felt like I was on an emotional roller coaster blindfolded. My journeys have included my grandmother, my dad, overlapping that by a few years was my husband. I've learned a lot. And my goal in what I'm doing now is helping caregivers learn faster and more easily than I did. So we move from feeling frustrated, overwhelmed, and yes, sometimes frightened, to confident, balanced, and supported in our caregiving journeys. Well, that is absolutely fantastic and very much needed for sure. Nancy, how about you? Why don't you share a little bit about yourself? Thank you. Um, Well, Sue and I have been friends for a very long time. And uh, I am a recently retired software industry veteran, but I have also been in caregiving roles for about 25 years with my father, my father-in-law, and uh, my husband. Currently with my husband and father-in-law, both are um, I'm in the middle of both of those, one with, uh, both with dementia, uh, different kinds. And uh, I uh, also understand how physically exhausting, mentally exhausting, and, uh, you know, caregiving is. 
And I find that it's really important to make sure that you can find solutions to common day-to-day challenges. So my goal is to also provide ways for people to, to just get uh, day-to-day um, answers to their questions much more quickly than I was ever, ever able to. So are, are you two, um, either of you, because our audience won't know this, in a caregiving role specifically right now for a family or loved one? And Nancy, I'll let you go first. Yes, I am. I am currently caring for my husband, who's uh, about nine years into frontotemporal dementia, uh, and he's here at home. And my father-in-law, who's about five years into Alzheimer's, um, I, they live about three miles away, and I'm their primary caregiver as well. Yowza, that's a lot. Yes. It is a lot. It is a lot. And thanks to a lot of support from my close friend, Sue, uh, who's been through both of these things herself. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot and I'm, I, I feel like I'm handling it right now. Anyway, I, people ask me how things are going. I like to say it's under control because that's about all you can ask for. Okay. Yeah. And how about you, Sue? For the first time in a little over 16 years, I am not in an active role and actually, tomorrow is the one year I say we celebrated my husband's birthday back into heaven. It'll be a year tomorrow. And a man of deep faith, he didn't fear God or see death as the end of life. And so I say we're celebrating his birthday back into heaven. Oh, what a nice way to, to frame that. I like that. Um, and I think that'll help a lot of other people because that's a struggle. You know, it's uh, yeah. grief and processing that is is so important but how we frame it makes all the difference in the world it does that. so um kudos um i want to um ask you guys also how did you how did you two come together i always find it interesting with partnerships you know are, are you neighbors did you meet at a conference you know what what happened and um sue do you want to take that sure what happened is that Nancy and I had been talking together as she was navigating her journey with Kim and with her dad, and I was giving her insights into things I had learned. Last summer, I went up, Nancy lives in Atlanta, and I live in Naples, Florida. I went up to visit family in Atlanta and stopped by to see Nancy and her husband. And Nancy said, I just really have struggled to find practical tips and things that I really needed. And I said, well, I've you know, I've, I've been wanting to start a podcast. Why don't the two of us get to get together and do something together? We had known each other early, early, early in our professional careers. And I won't share how many years ago that was, but she, her husband and I were at worked at the same company and we were actually neighbors for a period of time and then lost touch. And then our journey with our diagnoses of dementia brought us back together. And it's now connected us even more tightly with our passions to, to help others. Wow. Anything she, she missed on that, Nancy, that you want to add in? I'll tell you, it's over 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time. It's been a long, it's a long time. Yeah. But, but that's a wonderful part of friends. And it's humorous because as we've been talking together more, we finish each other's sentences. We'll have the same idea at the same time. So it was like, there was a gap of, of time and it's like, all that's gone. It's just as though it was, it, you know, in the beginning. Yes. Isn't that funny? You meet certain people and there is no time lapse, no matter how much time has gone by. Um, exactly. I, and I just precious, the, you know, um, I, I just have so much um, love for, for those particular people because not everybody is like that. And it's just so precious to be able to, to have somebody that you work with. And like you said, to complete sentences that you can talk about anything you can argue and it's not an argument. It's just, let's move through it type thing even if you've got a difference of opinion you you grow from it and and things so that's that's neat to see that you guys were brought together um so I, I wanted to ask you about you know the motivation to kind of launch this this whole the caregiver's journey the practical tips and you know the candid conversations and things about Alzheimer's and, and dementia for caregivers was it all sparked from Nancy? It sounds like you had this idea, you know, wheeling in your head before, um, and then when she said, "Gosh, I can't find it," it just kind of merged and blossomed. Or, you know, how much how much work, I guess, did you put into that concept prior to, and you probably both were thinking about that. So I'll come back to you as well, Nancy. 
Several years ago, I wrote a book called Our Journey of Love, Five Steps to Navigate Your Caregiving Journey as a passionate communicator and as somebody who really did want others to learn better, I had started sharing those messages. And the more I shared them, the more I got questions outside the framework of that book. And what I recognized is people were asking questions about the entire caregiving journey. And so I began the caregiver's journey and I created the five phases of the caregiver's journey. And yet I knew I wasn't maximizing what its potential was. It was just me. And I really felt like it was something that was meant to be collaborative. And when Nancy and I got together, it was just like, this is what had been waiting. And so she and I are now full partners. And we are just going to town with so many ideas for now and for in the future. She's teaching me words like telegraphing and all of these other things because she's a great marketing expert. And, and kind of reining me back. But, but what we did is we took something that had been a foundation that was kind of wanting to be more and and we're making it more. And where we, we figured because we are both speakers and communicators and we both thought a podcast would be a great way to communicate, we decided that our first offering would be this podcast because we both have so many practical tips. And, and this is part of the thing that brought us together even more my journey has been, for example, with my dad and with my husband, where the wisest choice for us was to move them into a continuing care community. Nancy has kept her husband at home and her father-in-law is still at home. So we have complementary journeys and different experiences and the practical tips we have run a really broad gamut of support for people, no matter what their choices are. And it just, every time we come up with something, it just seems like it's more, more helpful and more helpful because of the, the variety of experiences and stories we've got with all of our collective journeys over so many years. Well, and what I love about that is it shows the, the similarities and the differences you know, and I think one of the things I always got frustrated with is stop giving me this cookie cutter one answer. It yes, work that way. And yes. so what you guys are pulling together, it's it's fluid. And you're going to have people that are in the middle of all of that too. going, what do we do? Or they're going to have multiple people. You know, some people rotate the person with dementia from house to house from, you know, the kids. And I mean, th there's no right or wrong answer. And it's complicated. And so we have to share our ideas because that might, you know, um, spark an idea for someone else that they hadn't thought of before. So that was one of my questions I was going to ask was that you guys must have had some some differences there. But I, you know, Nancy, what do you want to add to that? So I would say um, what I find most interesting is exactly what you described it's amazing that how many of the challenges are the same, the, the challenges, but the way Sue tackled some things and the way I tackled some things, obviously somewhat dependent on the individual themselves and how they were, you know, interacting with us. So some of it is, is great ideas simply because the person is different. They say, if you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia, you know, and, and so I think, so a lot of it is the person, but uh, her husband acted very differently than my husband did in a lot of situations. So we had very different approaches. But the interesting thing is so many of the challenges are exactly the same. The core day-to-day -day challenges are similar. The approaches, the tips um, are uh, in a lot of ways very different. But I thought I knew because I've gone through two of these. And then Sue's gone through three solid day-to-day -day ones and more than that, but three that she had day-to-day -day interaction with on a regular basis. And I think she thought she knew. And then we share stories and it's like, well, that's not what happened at my house. And that's not what happened at my house. And, and we come up with, well, you know, well, then let's suggest this. And, and so let's have five tips instead of three, because we've got that approach, that approach, and that approach. And it's, it's really been... Um, insightful, I think, probably more than anything, as to how many practical tips are available for common day-to-day -day dementia challenges. Well, and one of the things that's common between the two of us, Lori, is that we both had a, 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 a challenge that frustrated us, which is kind of what led us to wanting to do this, was, is we would go to look for answers and we couldn't find them. Right. We, we, or we could find a sentence about something at a high level and it's like, okay, well, yeah, but how do you do something about it? And we both had that frustration of, I wish I had known. 
and coming together and sharing those things, we want other people not to have to say, I wish I'd known. Yeah. And there's a there's a lot of that, along with the would have, should have, could have, yeah. you know, type deal. And and it is frustrating. I mean, that's what got me into this, too, was like I didn't want others to feel how I felt. Right. And and I just right. thought it was ridiculous. And even with, um, you know, all the curation stuff we have on Alzheimer's Speaks it was it was my process of learning but i why learn by myself why not share that knowledge and then <laughs> oh, say exactly. a bunch of map just kind of expanding that because there is no place for people to be able to find one another without googling or be lucky enough to listen to a podcast which you know that's just really kind of coming you know to itself in the last few years or accidentally having somebody say something or overhearing somebody say something, you know, and then we're, I I know that happened to me a lot. And I'm like, excuse me, but I'm dealing with that right now. Can I join this conversation? And I wasn't shy because I was like, hello, Uh, there's somebody like me. I didn't know that they even existed out there, you know, (laughs) and so. um, And what you're doing with Dementia Map is so transformative for people on this journey and for people who will have a passion to help others on the journey. It's such a great hub to bring everyone together in a responsible way. I mean, it's, it's wonderful and it's been completely lacking. So you've really gotten ahead of the curve with that and built up something that's already robust to help bring people together. So thank you. Cause I know the number of hours you've been investing in this to try to put it together. And now it's, it's bearing fruit for everybody. And it's simple to use. And, you know, again, for, for the public, so often everything costs something. 20 bucks here and, 20, and people are like, well, what's 20 bucks? And it's like, well, when you keep adding up your 20 bucks, it's a lot. Yeah. You know, when you're trying to put food on the table and gas in the car and get those medications paid, you know, it, it can be it can be a lot. And mm-hmm. so to have that free accessibility and to be able to welcome all you know, areas. And I don't know if you guys have found this, but I haven't found that profits, nonprofits and government agencies play well together in in being equal. And we need to equalize that big money doesn't mean best services necessarily. And, and we're all coming from different angles. And what excites me right now is I'm really seeing this buildup of and I still call us grassroots effort. Because, yeah. we, because we don't always fit into these slots. People don't know that they're all different and um, that not everybody plays in the, the playground well together. And I, But I'm seeing more and more of people stepping up, stepping in, going, you know what? I did learn a lot on this and I should share this information with people. And what I hear from people that like you guys are helping is, oh my gosh, I don't know what I do without this. I mean, it's someone who's actually lived the, you know, the walk and they, they, they can help guide me and steer me away from some of the major pitfalls or some of my even imaginary fears when I pick up a book like, uh, and I'll use the example. And again, nothing against the 36 hour day, but a lot of people pick that book up and thought, all of this is going to happen. You know, and then they would get really overwhelmed and to have that voice of, but no, calm down. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not all going to happen and it's not all going to happen at once. And um, just letting them know it's an individual journey. And Sue, from the experience, you know, of knowing you in the past of bringing in that peaceful spiritual side. And I'm not talking a specific religion. I am just saying there is a peace with connecting to a higher power other than yourself in this journey that can be absolutely incredible for you and the person you're caring for and calm the nerves because, you know, they get pretty frayed at times. So really it's interesting how you guys came together. It's interesting the synergy you've kind of had all of these years and how, how it was sparked. It, it um, magnifies that, you just don't know who's going to get dementia. I'm sure mm-hmm. neither of you looked at the other and go, yeah, probably that one. You know, I mean, in 20 years on our mutual dementia journeys. Exactly. Yeah. No yeah, question. You, you just don't, yeah. you just don't know that stuff. So Nancy, I want to ask you a little bit about 
kind of formatting, you know, this whole candid conversation and practical tips. That's got to be a process in and of itself to go, okay, what are our priorities going to be? And how are we going to, how are we going to communicate this? And you've talked about, you know, the, the podcast and things, but um, tell us a little bit more of big picture. What, what all is the caregiver's journey and, and what it offers people? So, so we'll just talk about the format of almost everything we're doing mm -hmm. is because of that frustration of not, it not being easy to find the right solutions to day-to-day -day challenges. We're taking a very tip oriented, target oriented approach. So um, we have a, a podcast on wandering and it's got five tips on when your caregiver keep your caregiver from wandering outside and five tips on them wandering what happens and things you can do about them wandering inside. We have an episode on removing driving privileges and it's four tips on how to remove driving privileges. And it's, you know, walks you through the process of things you can do to, and hopefully you, you finish after tip one, but if you don't go to tip two, and if you can't get the driving privileges gone after tip two, here's what you do with tip three. So it's very, um, we say practical tips, we stick to that format pretty closely. When we say candid conversations, it's because honestly, um, Sue and I work really hard to not hide behind the hard um, topics. And I, I sometimes think when I'm reading, to Sue's point earlier, when you're reading, you, you type in something and Google it and you come back and you get to a paragraph on a topic. Sometimes I think it's because I, I think, well, yeah, but so much more, right? Because they're just skimming the surface, but sometimes they're skimming the surface because it's a hard topic. Um, and Sue and I try not to skim the surface on hard topics. We try to drive in and talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly on this topic. And, you know, let's be honest, this thing's going to happen. Um, and what might be a one paragraph when you Google something is probably a 20 minute podcast with us with some real specific um, solution recommendations. And really, we just say, consider doing this, consider doing this. Um, but, it, and then we're very topical about them. So wandering is a topic. Removing driving privileges is a topic. So we're very topical. And then our tips are very oriented towards that particular topic. Um, and that's our strategy. And that's our strategy with our podcasts. That's our strategy with our blogs. Um, we also have a online uh, course that is very tip oriented. And we have Sue's book, which is fantastic, which also has tips in it. I'll be honest, that's one of the first things I did when I found out my husband had dementia. I knew Sue's husband had dementia and she'd written a book. I read it and it was a fan, it is a fantastic book. Um, it really, I, I jokingly tell Sue, the name of it should be how to get your head right about being a caregiver. <laughs> it really helps you put your mind, put your, put your head in the right place. Cause that's, I think we all know that's probably the biggest challenge of all as a caregiver, how do you get your head right? And then what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I love, I love that strategy. And I love that you point out, you Google and you get, you know, a couple of sentences or a paragraph. And a lot of times I find, or I feel, I should say, that people are, are doing that because they know how to search engine optimize. They know it's mm -hmm. a hot topic, mm -hmm. but they don't, they don't really have anything about it. Right. Caregiving is not SEO. Caregiving is you got a problem. We need a we need a solution, and we're we're focused on let's give you the tips. And you're so right that there it's more we we've seen that in the kind of the results that sometimes come at not for all of them, but that sometimes come back, and we're like, no, we're going to put it right out there. Yeah, no, and you get you read a paragraph and you're like, that's content free. I'm not even sure what was what did that even say, right? We're yeah. very, we're very direct, we're very frank in our conversations. We still have a good time because some of these things you either laugh or you cry, right? We do a lot more laughing than cry for what that's worth. <laughs> so we, you know, hopefully they're serious conversations, but we do them. We, we make light of the things that we're capable of making light of because like I said, you, everyone who's a caregiver knows you either laugh or you cry because <laughs> you, you're just trying to get through the day. Well, in some of the stories, that that are the ones that we tell about a tip we learned the hard way when we've when we've moved past it we can now laugh with and right. at ourselves because we really didn't know and nancy's got some that i mean she, she just goes like seriously yeah, do you want me to tell the one about the chimes sue 
So I'll give an example and I'll, I'll just I'll start with the story and then the example will follow or the tip will follow. So my husband wandered out of our house and up the street. And fortunately, one of the neighbors called and said, your husband is at our house. Would you like us to bring him back down or would you like to come get him? So fortunately, I went up and got him and crisis averted. He was only three houses up the street and he had gone to a neighbor who knew me and knew he had dementia. So but that was a wake up call. You know, he's he's I, no longer safe to just let him go in and out of the house as he sees fit. So we have a security alarm and I never turn the chimes on. So, you know, they some security alarms have the chimes. So it dings when the, an external door is open. I thought, I'll fix this. I'll turn the chimes on on the security alarm. Mm -hmm. So that evening I turned the chimes on the security alarm and went to bed. The chimes went off all night long, <laughs> all night long. I don't know if he'd been going outside and back in for weeks and I just didn't know it, or if the sound of the chimes was so interesting that he um, decided to open and close the door on and off all night long. But I, every time- to, 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 to put that in frame of reference though, Nancy, it was a door from his bedroom out to the porch so he couldn't actually get out of the house. But it was still chiming all night long. It was chiming all night. Oh, I had to get up every time and go see what was happening because the chimes were going out off, obviously. So after that, I called a locksmith and the next morning and said, you have to come put deadbolt, double deadbolt locks on my house where you have a key on the inside and the key on the outside because I can't let him open. He's obviously opening and closing the external doors to go outside all the time. So the locksmith came that day. It's not cheap in case, you know, you, you don't know to have double deadbolt doors, deadbolts put on all your external doors. It's very expensive. And so I solved the problem. But then not long after that, I'm talking to someone in one of the support groups and they put those childproof doorknob covers on their door. Well, those are very inexpensive, by the way. And I thought, well, there's no way he'll be able to use that. There's no way that's going to keep him from getting out the door. But I had some inside doors that I wanted him to not be able to get in certain rooms anymore. So I bought some. He has no idea how to use them. I could have saved chimes, the chime deal, the double door, dead doors, all sorts of things if I just thought to put childproof doorknob covers on the doors leading to the outside. Yeah. So the tip is the childproof doorknob covers. Might as well start with that, right? But... The story is, uh, I took me a lot of gyrations to get there. I, I love the way you go at these tips. A lot of people throw tips out just in general, but a lot of people don't organize them in terms of try the simplest thing and the least expensive thing first, mm -hmm. exactly. you know, and that's, that's huge. And if you, you know, if that doesn't work, then okay, go to plan B. Okay. Mm -hmm. C's here, D's here too. Exactly. Yeah. For you to be able to find so that's a wonderful a wonderful approach i i also like that you've got the the blog and you know you've got the course and then of course sue's book as well so i mean there's a lot within this platform and this company that you've created uh, to offer because everybody learns different somebody might want to read a book somebody might want to go to a course some people might want to just listen to the podcast when they're going for a walk or whatever and others like me you know you want all of the above because I need the reminders you know and all the different various ways you know that that comes to comes to be anything you want to add there Sue about kind of your your formatting and your your messaging to to make it easy I mean it sounds like this has been really a well thought out process. It's some people just get together and go, yeah, let's do it. And then they're just shooting from the hip. But you sound like you both applied your your business acumen and said, no, nope, let's let's make a, a formal plan here and be consistent with this. Yes. And one thing I would compliment that with. So thank you for that question. One thing I would compliment it with is that, you know, like Nancy said, we're not shying away from the good or the bad or the ugly. We're also not shying away from the differences between things that are in the beginning, the early stages of the journey, that when, when, when they still think or do actually have control, and then what I call that, that messy middle, 
when we're still asserting, con we've started asserting control, and yet they still have some control, but it's it's getting more, and it's it's pretty messy. They they know they've got the disease. There's some frustration, and then what we call later on when we've really taken control, and the tips are different based on the different phases that they're in. And when I use the word phase, I don't talk about phases, and neither does Nancy, where it's like, okay, in the diagnosis, there's phase one, and then phase two, and there's phase three, because neither one of us want people to try to put them into a medically diagnosed phase. What we talk about is you can pretty much tell when they're in the beginning. You can pretty much tell when they're in the, the messy middle. And you could pretty much tell when it's later on. So our tips are specific to that so that, be, that people, no matter where they come in on the journey, we're going to have tips for them. Right. Well, and, and, I, and I really think of them more as caregiving phases than, than dementia phases or stages. That's a way to sort of separate it. You know, in the beginning, you're helping them maintain their independence, but you're behind the scenes like uh, the duck under the pond. You're paddling as fast as you can, try to help them think they're independent anyway. And then, as Sue said, the messy middle is uh, is messy, as we know. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that phrase, caregiving stage, because that you don't really hear anybody talk about that. And it really is so much depends on you know what mindset or heart set we're in yes in terms of trying to handle all of this stuff and what our out outcomes are going to be and you know that's critically important um, if you're just tuning in we have been talking with the founders of the caregivers journey uh, both sue ryan and nancy tesser and uh, fascinating conversation and they are launching this wonderful new program that is going to benefit so many people. Nancy, do you want to tell us how people can reach you? Certainly, we'd love to have them join us. Uh, we are on uh, our website at the, the caregivers with an S journey.com. Um, you can also find us on Facebook at the caregivers journeys with an S on both caregiver and journeys and then Instagram at the caregivers journey. Okay. Wonderful. And then um, Sue also have, you have your own website. Yes. It's Sue Ryan dot solutions. Okay. So thank you. So again, check them out. And Sue's book I'll just mention is our journey of love five steps to navigate your caregiving journey as well. So um, lots of good information there. I want to just add in, um, and we were talking about this earlier, but I want to give a plug for uh, Q for Good, which is a webmaster, and they just do an absolutely fantastic job. So if you're a caregiver or if you're a professional and you've got a website and you want to reduce your stress, these guys mm. are amazing. Um, I have had a lot of bad experiences over the year, and uh, I just highly, highly recommend them. And they love working with companies that are kind of joining forces for the greater good as well. And I really appreciate that about them as well. So I just wanted to pass that along and let you know, too, that if you mention my name, you can get a 10% discount. So that never hurts. Ooh. Things are expensive these days. So, you know, to get good quality and get a get a break. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, let's get back to our conversation. Sue, I want to ask you about, you know, what lessons did you guys probably learn from one another in in this project of melding together? I, I just I can't even imagine all of the wisdom that you guys have shared in the aha moments, it, as well as I do that too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that there's a, a mutual lesson that we that we each had learned separately and we were modeling and I had put a little bit more formal structure around it and yet Nancy was modeling and it was great. And that is that I learned in my journey, especially from an experience with my dad where I felt like I was really letting him down, mm -hmm. that, that if I just completely accept in the moment exactly what's happening without judgment of myself or the situation or anyone else. I'm not wishing it was the way it had been. I'm not fortune telling what the future might be, but just say, okay, this is what's going on in the moment. Then I have the ability to just be in the moment, be fully present in the moment. Where are they in the moment so I can get at their level and be with them wherever they are in that moment and make the wisest choices? And what Nancy and I recognized and what we've kind of 
observed from each other is while we had languaged it differently, what we had both learned is the importance of that and how much it changes. You're not fighting things. You're not wasting energy on things that aren't going to be what they were. It's like, okay, what do we have access to? And we're not looking at, well, yesterday, or we're not worrying about well, what is it going to be like tomorrow? We're like, okay, what do we have access to now? And I think that, you know, Nancy, I don't want to speak for you, but it, it seems like it's just really helped the dynamic of our working together because that's how both of us are. Mm -hmm. And that's how both of us are. And, and I learned it through my caregiving experiences and have now brought it into all the other areas of my life. I think it's a, it's a huge inflection point as a caregiver. When you get when you get that message, what Sue's talking about, and you figure out to stop wishing for the way it was and stop trying to figure out and stop, you know, extrapolating into the future, what does this mean for the next, you know, for the future? That's where all that I that's where I figured out most of my anxiety came from was one of those two things. And if I could stop doing that and just live in the moment, deal with the moment, be the best I can be in the moment, help my caregiver be the best they can be in the moment, then I had peace of mind. And that was, I, I discovered it. Sue articulates it in a fabulous way. I When, when I heard, heard Sue articulate it, I'm like, that's it, that's it. That's what I've been trying to say. Because that is exactly where you, that's how as a, a caregiver, that's where you get peace of mind. And it is such a huge um, lesson when you finally internalize that and, and start acting that way. That's the first time you really have peace as a caregiver, in my opinion. And I can so relate to that. I call it tears, fears, and joy is mm -hmm. kind of how I separate it out. But it's nice to hear how other people say things because, you know, different people are going to resonate with different verbiage. Right. And, you know, but yet, when they're listening and most of them are going to, you know, listen to multiple podcasts and talk to various people in the industry and go to different support groups and, and those types of things. But from the care partner, you know, care companion, caregiver, care, whatever you want to say, it's reassuring that, Oh, they're saying the same thing, just different. It really, I think gives such a calming um, relief and you feel like this is a team sport, you know, and people are sharing. And then I also think that it inspires people to now share what words do they use to describe this? Yes. And they're more comfortable sharing the information that, that they've heard and that they feel for themselves. And, and so to me, and in no disregard to some of the large organizations in, in different ways, but you know, I kind of break down the industry into, and I'm sure there's more ways to segue this, but we have the academic and medical model, and then we have the in the trenches model. Yes. And I, and I think we need all three of them. Right. And I, and I think the storytelling from in the trenches is just mm -hmm. starting to see the light in the past few years because people, well, they didn't have a platform to speak on. And, you know, now podcasts are get, becoming easier to do, or, you know, they felt they couldn't do it, but they're seeing more people doing this. And, and they're feeling, I think, more comfortable being able to listen to something like this too, you know, because it doesn't typically cost them money and, it, and it's flexible and fluid in terms of when they can listen. Sure. How they can listen if it's on their computer, if they're going for a walk, if it's in yep. the car, you know, the accessibility is just there. And then I, th I think, too, the beauty with the podcast is they can hear the inflection of the voice. And then if you have a video podcast, then they get to see it as well. So all yes. of those levels mixing together, I think, have a huge, huge impact, just kind of like with a person with dementia will say, you know, if you're going to talk to me, look at me because I'm yes. going to read your lips and I'm going to, we all do that, you know, yes. so no, but it's, just, it's so unconscious, yes. but when we're, when we're strategizing, we have to take those things into consideration because they're massively huge and impactful. Oh, absolutely. And another one of the gifts of that, Lori, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, what I've learned through living from acceptance and presence is I'm invited into the, what I call, I'm invited into the consideration of alternative perspectives. It's easy for me to ask for help. 
It's mm-hmm. easy for me to reach out. And I believe that more and more people now will be able to, to get to resources that can be helpful when they have the ability to stay present and go, I don't have to have the answers. Now I can find them from other people and it's okay to ask for help. In my early journeys, there was nobody to ask. I know. No. There wasn't information and, and nobody talked about it. Yeah. And then, you know, even the medical information, I couldn't read it and there wasn't that much that helped. So now we've got so many more of us who are passionate about making it easier for other people. And when we accept, okay, well, this is what it is. And Nancy, you've got stories I know that are of family members who are just like, no, no, they're resistant to accepting the journey. And it's so much harder for them. That's, those are the people I keep trying to explain to. If you can just get to this point where you can stop trying to make things the way they used to be and stop freaking out about how this might manifest itself in the future, you'll you'll be in a much more peaceful place. But, you know, it's a little bit of you can say it all day long until someone inter- internalizes it. You know, that's the only way that it's going to work. You can't can't just tell it. They have to internalize it. Um, but I keep that is my, my mantra. That's I feel like if I can just get people to to, you know, try to to think that way it just helps so much yeah i i know for me just even on my my tears fears and joy thing um the way i explain it is you know when we're when we're having our tears because of you know all the ambiguous loss and then you know when someone finally passes you've got all this grief and it's really easy to swirl down and you need to i mean that's part of the grieving process you know um, you know, to feel that deeply. But one day it just hit me. It was like someone just slapped me in the face and said, Lori, how lucky are you to have loved so deeply to hurt this bad? Oh, and, and that, that's like, changed everything because yes. it's like, there's so many people that never loved that deeply to hurt that bad. Yes. Especially that in so the world sweet. that we live in today. And then for the fear, uh, you know, I'm kind of a you know, an A personality. And so I, I'm one where I want to prevent everything and I want to control everything. And my brothers would say, I'm a control freak. I would say I'm organized, but you know, <laughs> that's, just, that's a discussion for it works for you and you're going to keep it. Yeah. And so what I realized was I was planning for all these things that could happen. And what I realized I was doing it to make myself feel better. It had nothing to do with the person I was caring for. I conned myself into believing that, but it was really for me to feel in control. Mm -hmm. And then when I ask, you know, my audiences, do you want, you know, the, the tears, the fears or the joy? Of course, everyone says the joy. Mm -hmm. And then it hit me, you know, like a ton of bricks. It's like the only place that you can create joy or identify joy is in the present moment. So when when you focus there, everything else, it it doesn't like totally melt away, but you put it in a different perspective. And, and for me, everything started coming more from that heart level and that being relationship based, which I think is exactly what you guys are talking about. Exactly right. I agree with you. That's just a different way of saying the same thing. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't tug on you. It doesn't feel so heavy. It doesn't feel so hard. And, you know, to Sue's point about, you know, I could ask somebody, you know, when you're in that community, it's expected that you will ask. Yeah. You know, it's expected people, people encourage you to ask. And that's, that's a huge difference by itself, not feeling alone and feeling welcome to be able to share information because when you when you don't, when you're not connected, you just feel so lost, so lonely, so helpless. I mean, and it's it's easy to get depressed. It's easy to be more angry at life, right? And, versus when you you feel you're part of a tribe, and that that tribe is growing, and it's growing because of people like you stepping in, stepping out, and and speaking out, and in, and then inviting people in you know, and, and sharing the knowledge, the, you know, the, the tips that are, are practical and have been tested in the, you know, in the lab of life. I like that. We have to take that. So we're going to, we're going to have to use that one. Cause that's really exactly that's good. Day, in, day out basis. Yeah. Um, you know, and Lori, to your point about grief, 
every emotion we have, we're meant to have, or we it wouldn't be an emotion. I mean, if we weren't meant to learn lessons from the emotion of grief, it wouldn't exist. And people get stuck in it because they don't know what to do with it or they haven't been taught. And to your point, I mean, there are amazing lessons we can learn from grief that then position us to be able to move forward from grief. And that's part of what I intentionally put into the caregiver's journey is exactly to your point is that, okay, grieve, and yet we're meant to thrive in our lives. And so there comes a point in time, it doesn't mean that, the, that you are you're through your grief and yet you start moving forward because so many of us have intentionally chosen to put things on the shelf of our lives while we've been caring. And then we're, we get into the grieving process and we're feeling the emotions like you're talking about and we don't know how to get out. And yet we all know you can't have a high without a low. I mean, that's the measurement. Yeah, and so, you know, everything isn't going to going to last forever. But I think when we're dealing with illness, especially a chronic illness, um, and we're caring for someone else, we put ourselves in this high level of everything has to be perfect. Well, hello, sweetheart, life wasn't perfect before dementia hit. So why are you putting that expectation on things now? Not a good idea. <laughs> well said. Well said. <laughs> right, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So it's just, it's kind of funny, but that, you know, that outlook changes everything. And that outlook changes through storytelling. It changes through options. It changes through education, mm -hmm. you know, and we can really shift this whole doom and gloom to one of hope and joy that there's still great life to be lived. And, and that's what I love about what, you know, what, what you guys are doing together and what you've done individually, you know, you've, there's a high road and a low road and, and there's a middle road and you're going to bounce between all of them on this journey. So don't think you're not going to, but you can pick which is going to be your primary road. Yes. And, absolutely. and that's okay. Cause you know, it's kind of like a diet. You're going to slip up, you, you know, you're going to slide back, you know, or addictions, all of those types of things. This is not an easy thing but it's doable when you pull in the right support and when you develop the, the right mindset. So I, I just think it's incredible what you're doing. I do want to, if you guys have time, I would love you to talk a little bit about your course that you're launching so that people know what to expect on that too. I created the course, The Caregiver's Journey, with the caregivers in mind going through the different phases of the caregiver's journey. And it starts with, you know, the, the I call it the caregiver's primer. So some of the things that you can be planning for ahead of time, or that all of a sudden when you, there's the diagnosis and you want a PhD in being a caregiver and a PhD in the diagnosis. So things that there, and that's the whole structure of all the phases of the course are based on as caregivers, we're busy. So the lessons are short. They're focused on, again, giving tips and things to do. I created them in an audio format, a video format. I've got the printed PDF. I've got work guides. So, so you know, if you're sitting in the doctor's office, you could be reading something. If you are working out, you want to be listening to it. So I created it with different mediums, all with very short lessons to give people, again, these practical tips about all the phases. And so there's the caregiver's primer. And then the other thing that I felt was really important and, and so many things we've talked about today model that is called, uh, it, it's, it's understanding ourselves in a meaningful way. And it is understanding that we're naturally wired to view the world differently. We deal with stress differently. One of the most important things that will save our energy and help us on our journey is not trying to be like someone we're not is not, well, gee, they're able to do all these other things and I get all upset and everything. So it's it's really recognizing ourselves. And then there's, again, the, the steps for the messy middle. And then I, I created the fourth phase, I call it the grace of grief. And again, grief is an emotion that we are meant to have. It's got lessons for it. Like you said with your husband, you know, how, how blessed you are and your mom, you know, how blessed you are to have moments of pure love. And I felt that way uh, about my husband. And then moving forward, we're meant to thrive in our lives. So it's helping you then figure out how to start choosing the things you want to bring off the shelf or things that you're like, you know what? 
I, that's not a part of my life anymore. And so it, it helps you to realize it's okay to move forward. And so that course is something that just really gives people, no matter where they are in their journey, some, some uh, strategies, some tips, some guides of things to do and lessons learned. Um, you know, Lori, just a quick thing. I'll jump in the middle. There's a uh, just a quick version of Sue's self-care um, exercise or worksheet. Um, if you, if someone goes out to our Facebook page, the Caregivers Journeys with an S, you can find a video we did on on uh, caregiver self care, and it in, and includes. Um, she goes through the worksheet, and it's brilliant how you align the amount of time you have and the things you can do for self care, and then you put those two together. So if you have twenty minutes, you can look at your worksheet and say, I've got 20 minutes. Here's the three things that I can do in 20 minutes. One is to listen to one of Sue and Nancy's podcasts because those are 20 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> but, but it really is a wonderful approach to, to self-care, which comes direct. We stole it directly from the course. Again, I love how practical you are and how versatile you are and uh, allow flexibility in terms of, of lifestyle because, you know, that's nuts. And the whole self-care piece, I mean, that I know like when my dad died of brain cancer and my mom was still living with dementia, I spent so much time caring for both of them. And then my mom ended up in the nursing home because um, mm -hmm. she wanted to be there with him. My life changed so drastically. I didn't even know who I was. Yes. I, I, I didn't, I didn't even think about self-care because I didn't even realize I wasn't doing that, you know, but I heard, and this is, this is kind of an interesting story. I heard years later, I was, I was selling real estate and I had um, clients who had bought and sold multiple homes with me. And I ran into them someplace and I, you know, we were having a cocktail or something. And the, the wife said, gosh, you've got beautiful blue eyes. And I said, Oh, thank you. And, and then I made a joke like, well, I always have. And she said, no, you haven't. Wow. And I, and I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, Lori, we always loved you and you always had a bubbly personality, but your eyes were always dark. Oh, wow. Isn't that interesting? And, but you know, I believe it because you are wow. so, you have so much going on because you don't, you know, I didn't let go of anything. You know, I was still, I was working full time, but I was still caring for them. And, and, um, you know, sometimes I wasn't working full time because my team would take over, but you know, you're doing stuff by phone and, yeah. You know, you've got a kid, you're married, you're volunteering. I would have extra people in my house all the time. And um, you just don't give anything up. And then when life changes, people are like, well, what do you like to do? And I mean, my answer was literally. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I haven't asked myself that question in years. Yeah. You know, yeah. and people are like, well, what, what do you mean? And I'm like, I honestly don't know. Yeah, well, well, you, 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 you put so many things on the shelf and the philosophy that I, you know, I came to and I certainly didn't originate this, but self-care is not selfish. It's mm -hmm. self-love. Mm -hmm. And if we keep shaving things off sooner or later, we've shaved off more than we can and stay healthy. And when it, when we've shaved off too much, it is not pretty. Yeah. You've learned that. We've all learned that. Yeah. Well, people get sick or people pass or yeah. people don't act and, you know, they snap and they don't, they don't deal with situations. And then it's like the way they'd like to, and then you have the guilt and then that makes you feel even worse. And I mean, it's just such a horrible cycle to go through. So, uh, you know, one of my biggest lessons was, um, and I'm thankful for, I had girlfriends that did give up on me having coffee once a week mm -hmm. and, the way I ended up going back to coffee was they had asked me and I finally said, I'll come for 10 minutes. They're like roll out the red carpet. Here comes Lori. She's going to give you 10 minutes of her time. And I mean, I was kind of cocky when I said it. it, it was like, okay. But my intent was to get them off my back. So they would not call me anymore because I felt so overwhelmed. And I'm like, I can't do something for myself. How many times do I have to say this? Oh. And so I went to that coffee I stayed two hours and we laughed and we cried together wow. and I never missed another coffee because wow. I, it was the coffee in meeting that made me realize how empty I had become 
And, you know, that's kind of a slow drain. You don't, uh, anyways, I didn't notice it. It is a slow drain. And it, and it was like, uh, oh, I feel like myself again. I mean, I, yeah. I did, you know, I mean, I literally said that to myself. I told somebody one time, I found Nancy. I don't know where she's been, but I found her. Yeah. Um, I went to lunch. I had some friends ask me, they used to always ask me how I was doing. I'd say, I'm fine, because that's what you say, right? Yeah. And um, and finally, they insisted I go to lunch with them. So we went to, we went to lunch, this little group of, of friends, and they asked me how things were going, and I burst into tears. I didn't know I was going to burst into tears. I think I was as shocked as they were that I burst into tears. And that same group of friends, this has been probably three years ago, I still go to lunch with about once every six weeks. Um, and, th and the good news is I'm not the center of attention anymore. For week, for the first six months, it was all about me, right? So now it's not all about me anymore. Things have gotten much, uh, much more normalized. But it that your friends didn't give up on you and you know that makes a big difference because if they never forced you to feel guilty about not going to the coffee you would never have been put back in that situation yeah and like i said my intent was just to get rid of them just get them <laughs> off my back you know and and then yet you sit down and you see see the smiles and you, you feel the energy mm -hmm. you know? well, the other part of that story Lori, that is so valuable for us as caregivers is that each of us in our lives has seasons when we have the capacity to lean in and help others. Yep. And there are seasons in our lives where we benefit from those who love us, leaning into us. And that's what friendships and relationships are. And one of the things that makes me sad is when you have somebody who hesitates to take to accept help from others, when they are the first person who would offer to provide help to someone else, that we tend to have these skewed perceptions that we should oh, bad word, be able to do it all on our own or no, we're not going to burden anyone else. And yet, like both of your stories are, people really, really, really want to be there for us. And then in the course of our lifetimes, there will be many times when we're able to then be able to be there for them as well. And that's where these long-term relationships are. So, you know, great lessons learned. Well, and we don't realize that we're actually can be offending our friends. Like I thought we were closer than that. Why wouldn't they let me in? You know, and, and we tend to ignore the fact of why we help because it makes us feel good, yeah. you know? And, and so that's part of what you do. You, you know, you, you hold together your tribe and you honor them and we're taking that away from others. And that's a conversation that needs to be talked about more too. So we are a big proponent of creating a support team around you of your friends mm -hmm. and your family and get help and be, be good with it. You know, look, I think the point's valid, which is who's the first person who would give help? Sue Ryan. She's the first person to go help someone. And yet, you know, when other people are offering to help you, you're like, Oh no, no, don't want to bother you. But she's a great proponent of don't go that path. Let everyone yeah. who wants to help you, let them help you find something they can do. Well, and I think some of it is just the the stigma that we don't even recognize as stigma and the myth of life that that we are here to do everything on our own and be independent. You know, mm -hmm. the game of life is a team sport. Hello, <laughs> you know, and, and you're gonna you're gonna switch teams that time. You know, you're gonna switch roles. You're gonna be the coach. You're gonna be the player. You're gonna be the goalkeeper. You're gonna be all kinds of things at different points. And, and that's the experience of life. Yes. You know, so um, gosh, ladies, what a wonderful conversation. Any last thoughts? I would just reiterate, our goal is to help dementia caregivers have fewer surprises. So to help bring up whatever the topics are, give practical tips, have candid conversations and have fewer surprises. So to make their, their life easier than Sue and I had it. Um, that's part of what we want to make sure we're accomplishing here. Wonderful. And Sue, how about you? And Just one of the things that sometimes people confuse or they don't understand is that when we talk about dementia, dementia is the overall arching uh, umbrella. My husband am, had Alzheimer's disease. So it's all the different types. Nancy's father-in-law has Parkinson's. Her dad had Parkinson's. So it's, it's all the different types of dementias. And we specify that area because that's where we have so much experience in. And yet it's not, you know, there's frontotemporal lobe dementia there. There's the dementia with aphasia. There's the Alzheimer's. There's dementia with Lewy bodies. We've got exp experience in a variety of those different types and areas. Mm -hmm. And so our, our messages to are there to support all of them. 
Exactly. And again, it takes a tribe to, to get through this. So lean on, lean on people and lean into people and then let them lean on you. I, I think that that's the beauty of sharing is once the door opens to having a comfortable conversation, even on uncomfortable topics, we can have a comfortable conversation. And once that is done, people that think they don't know anything go, oh, I, I have learned some things on this journey and I can share too, because you're yes. leading by example, you're showing that. And again, to me that there's a lot of power in that. And then believing I, and I totally believe this. I don't know if you guys would agree, but what's good for dementia is good for all of the world. I haven't, I have not learned one thing on this journey really that I can't apply in many different ways mm. in my life. Absolutely. In our caregiving journeys, as well as everyday life. So many of the lessons I've learned, I now live my life from, and I, boy, I, I, I really don't, I just don't worry about the small stuff. Yeah. I don't sweat the small stuff. And basically just about everything is small stuff. I, I just tried to travel back from Atlanta and I was like, okay, we'll get there eventually. I, you know, Lori, I love that comment. I, I feel the same way. I've learned so much about having a positive look on my face, using positive language, saying thank you, good job, you know, all those things to reduce the fear and anxiety in my husband. And yet they make you feel better and you feel more positive. And I find myself using them with everyone now. Yep. Uh, you know, you what's wrong with that? Say being positive and saying thank you and good job all the time. Nothing. <laughs> it's a great yeah. idea. Well, and it has such a nice ripple effect and positivity and kindness, you know, kind of gets a short stick because everybody's pointing out all the chaotic stuff that's happening in the world. But boy, you know, that kindness, because we live in a really rough world these days, makes such a huge impact. I mean, it always has. But, you know, how many times have you, I don't know, like me, I'll go to Caribou and I'll get a coffee and every now and then someone will buy me a cup of coffee and then I'll buy the guy behind me a cup of coffee. Nice. And, uh, you know, they, they've had that on the news where we can't believe how many people are buying each other's, you know, coffees because yeah. of that. And it's changed everybody's day, you yeah. know. So it's all those little things matter. A smile can go a mile. So again, ladies, thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing and sharing your journeys and trying to make life easier for the next guy out there. I love your strategies and the way that you are kind of webbing this out to make it easy access and simple for people. You know, we, we need things to be as simple as possible. So for our listeners, I want to thank you. I hope you will join Alzheimer Speaks and be a giver of hope. You know, like, click and share because there are people in your spheres that need to hear this information. You know, it's it's not about chasing the numbers. Never done that. It, it's not about that. It is about helping the next person who may be dealing with this already that you don't know because they don't feel safe enough to even talk about it. That's got to change. And we can all have impact on that. So, and then last, I just want to, again, say, you know, go visit their website, the caregiver If you go to Facebook, it's journeys with an S. Um, they are also on Instagram and then uh, Sue Ryan dot solutions. You can go to that as well to, to get her book, but so many things that they've covered. And again, um, go to that Facebook page and, you know, check them out and look at that video on self care. There isn't a soul out there that doesn't need information on self care. I don't care where you are in the journey, you might be feeling like you're handling it now, but you're going to need it again later because <laughs> this, this <laughs> rides a roller coaster, baby, <laughs> you know, for sure. So thank you so much, ladies. Thank you, Lori, for having us. And thank, thank you for giving us the opportunity to help share with your community. Well, I am I am thrilled to have it, have uh, this available to my audience. I just think it is so critical for people to be able to connect because none of us and none of us own this space and people have a right of choice. You know, they're going to align with different people at different times and that's perfectly fine. And they're going to tap into multiple things and you know, we have to be collaborative instead of um, right. there's some people in companies that think that they own the space and they they kind of get their, 
you know, hairs on the back of their neck uh, rattled up and rised up because of competition. And you know, I just don't look at us as competitors. There's there's way too many people that need the help. And we're all doing it, you know, twisting it in a, a little different package. Sure. And that's a good thing. That's yeah, that's what Sue always says. Sue always says, look, you know, we're going to reach out to every other dementia podcaster we can find because we want to connect as many people as we can to hopefully what we're doing that might can help. But there's no there should be no competition. Everybody's trying to do the same thing. We we yeah. believe yeah, everybody's trying to get to those poor caregivers who need the help. As I say, we're all on this journey together. She yep. sure does. Well, thank you, ladies. Appreciate it so much. So one last time, I'm just going to mention, uh, please head over to alzheimerspeaks.com. Check out all those free resources that we have, as well as dementiamap.com. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.